Bruce. Yes. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us on the American chestnut tree. Um, we're so excited and I can't wait to learn from you. So I'm going to turn it over to you right now so we can start learning. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'm really pleased to see so many of you here today. Um, um, so because it's a large group, um, Bronwyn's going to curate the chat box with for questions, but I'm happy to take questions along the way. So if you have them or if I've lost you on something, put it in the chat box and she'll interrupt me. Um, I'm wearing my official Chestnut Foundation hat. And now I'm going to take it off. Um, so now that it's shown, it's um, our logo. The American Chestnut Foundation is a, a nonprofit dedicated to the restoration of the American chestnut to the Eastern United States forests for the benefit of the ecosystem and for mankind in general. We, um, the approach that we take is one of several different approaches that different organizations have used to try to restore the American chestnut. And um, I will try to cover some of that material or, or describe some of that other work as well, not just talk about what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna risk losing you because I wanna show you something. When we set up this meeting, I had no idea I'd be in the Catskills today, um, but I'm at my mother-in-law's place in the Catskills. 13 years ago, I planted some American chestnuts uh, and I want to show you what they look like um, now. So let's pray that the Wi-Fi signal holds up and the computer doesn't get rained on too much. And if you see those trees sticking out over the back of the cabin there, those are American chestnuts and they're 13 years old. It's a little bit of a trick because they're on a hill, so they're not quite as tall as they look, but they are um, 20 to 25 feet tall. It's a fast growing tree and it's thriving here um, in the East Coast. Um, this is an area that, where there were not a lot of chestnuts even before the blight. And so there isn't a lot of chestnut blight fungus growing in the woods. Um, so they've lasted a long time, but this year, uh, three trees showed serious infections. I had to take them down so that they wouldn't infect all the others. Uh, but that's better than we usually do in our orchards. So I'm, I'm pleased with how it's gone. I'm gonna bring up a PowerPoint, um, tried and true PowerPoint that will help us uh, talk about or, or cover, cover this material. Uh, we call this the rise and fall and potential recovery of the American chestnut. You can tell I work for the State Department with the potential recovery there, being very cautious in my words, um, although I actually am quite optimistic. And I can't really talk much about the rise, uh, except to say that before the blight, the chestnut was um, a very significant and very common tree in the eastern United States. This photo on this cover slide was taken in the 1800s, I think in Pennsylvania. Um, it's a very large hey, tree. Yes? I don't think you're sharing yet. Oh, wow, you're too bad. It's a really nice slide. No, hold on a second. Um, <laughs> I gotta find it. See, thank you for keeping me honest. Yep, you're right. Okay. All right, let's try this again. All right, am I sharing now? Yes, you are. Okay, so uh, it, this is a very dramatic photo, a little bit of a trick of depth of field here, but the trees were quite large um, and fast growing, way up in the canopy with the white oaks. Um, these are not your garden variety Chinese chestnuts. These are very serious, large hardwood trees. Um, and unlike the oaks, uh, which they're related to, the chestnuts are in the Fagaceae family with the beeches and oaks, um, but the chestnuts produce more food than the oaks do. The oaks have good years and bad years. Chestnuts crank out nuts, very palatable nuts. I don't know if you've ever tried to eat an acorn, but chestnuts are much better. 
um, and they do it every year. And they, uh, you know, increased the amount of calories produced by the forest and enabled uh, the far, you know, an acre of forest to support a much larger um, wildlife population than it can now. Um, and that was all lost uh, when the chestnut blight fungus came in. Um, there are seven, at least seven, actually up to 11, depending on how you um, divide them, species of chestnut around the world, Chinese, Japanese, European, American, um, and then several other species, which we call chinkapins. Uh, they're smaller trees that only produce one nut instead of uh, per cluster. Um, which had, there are two species in the US and several in China. Um, they're all related, they can all be crossed with each other, um, but they've diverged over evolutionary time. Um, to give you an idea of how common chestnut was here in North America, this is a picture of Shenandoah um, National Park. If you've been there, you may recognize these buildings. Uh, this was taken in the 1930s, just before the chestnut blight epidemic reached the area. And you'll see, even though it's black and white, there's some trees that look kind of white and frosty. Those are the chestnuts flowering. This was probably taken in mid-June. And I include it just to show how common the tree was there. It's, you know, at least a quarter of the, of the, um, of the timber stand in that area. And you still find the sprouts there, but no trees in the canopy and very little flowering. This is the original, more or less, uh, range of the chestnut. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's an East Coast tree. Um, we'll see a different version of this map in a few minutes, but it covers quite a, uh, a, lo a long range. Um, you know, from down in Alabama, which is almost subtropical, all the way up to Maine. Um, and in parts of Canada, the tree has uh, a lot of variability in its leafing time, uh, its growth season, and its to cold tolerance. We know from recent genetic research that the American chestnut um, rebounded after the last ice age uh, so that the southern populations, what you find down in Tennessee and the Carolinas and Alabama, uh, is much more diverse. Um, and then there's sort of a mid-Atlantic population and then a, a New England population, which is the least diverse. And this is because the trees colonized progressively, you know, new territory as the glaciers receded and the, and the climate got warmer. Um, and there may even be, there's a subpopulation in Alabama that may actually be a different species. People are arguing about that now. Um, chestnuts are food uh, for people and wildlife. I have uh, in the upper left, you can see a picture of the chestnut burr, which is the spiky fruit case that has three nuts in it. That's usually how it goes. Just so happens if, can you see me as well as the slides? So this is on one of the trees that cut down. They just started flowering and making these burrs. So by the end of September, this will get a little bit bigger um, and turn brown, and then it'll crack open and the nuts will just drop out. So it stays squirrel proof until then. Um, very clever of the tree to do that. It was a very important cash crop for a lot of rural people who would go into the woods or to chestnut orchards, collect nuts and sell them as a cash crop uh, in the cities. Um, they don't do that anymore. Now we import uh, from Europe or we uh, use Chinese chestnuts grown here. Another important um, uh, you know, uh, factor as a chestnut as a resource was it, its value as a timber. Um, chestnut wood, if any of you have ever seen it or worked with it, looks a lot like oak, but it's very light. It's light like pine, when it's stronger than pine. But the main characteristic of it that's important is it's very rot resistant. So in Europe, where they still have a viable chestnut timber industry, they use it for fences, doors, shutters, uh, shingles, things like that, because it's like cedar or locust. It doesn't rot very readily. These are pictures of a log cabin and a fence that 
were made with pre-blight chestnut before the blight hit, they're still there. Um, and you can still find that stuff. So you could imagine if we can bring this tree back, it could reduce demand for that nasty pressure treated lumber that we buy at Home Depot to make our decks. Um, this is what the chestnut blight fungus uh, does to the tree. It's a bark disease. Um, and I actually have more show and tell. I don't know if there's a way to enlarge my picture, but this is also another piece uh, of the chestnut, uh, showing chestnut blight fungus from the trees I cut down at my mother-in-law's. So the fungus um, comes in the form of spores and it cannot penetrate the bark by itself. So it, it's harmless to the tree until there's some sort of crack. Um, this looks like there were insect holes in this photo and that the fungus got in through the insect holes. Um, but more commonly, you see it like this in the crotch of a branch because when the wind blows, you get little micro cracks in the bark and the spores get in there and they germinate and they get down into the live tissue and start to grow. And then you see these little orange um, things sticking out of the bark, those are fruiting bodies and they produce massive amounts of, of spores. Uh, in the piece I've got in my hand, it, the tree has swollen to try to block the infection. You can see that here, but everything distal to the infection now is dead. But what's below is still alive. We still have green leaves coming off the tree. Um, so it's not a systemic disease. It just gets into the bark and then stops the nutrients from flowing up and down. And that's, that's how it kills. Um, the, uh, in this picture here, you see the re-sprouting happening also. When you cut the, sorry, uh, when you cut the, the stem or you block it off with fungus, the tree will send up new shoots. And it's that ability. Um, first of all, that's one of the reasons the tree is so common because when people would cut down the chestnuts in the woods, they would always grow back, whereas other species might not. Um, but in this case, it's saved us because the death of the stems doesn't mean the death of the tree. The root systems will send up new shoots, at least for a while. And that's what's preserved the, the genetics of the tree. If you see a chestnut today, it probably looks something like this, uh, or maybe more like a tree, but you probably won't see anything up in the canopy. And a tree like this could be 60 years old. They just grow like one new leaf each year. And you know they're really just slow growing. They grow under in the shade. And because they never get big enough for the bark to form a texture or fissures, the fungus doesn't get in and they survive. Um, once they do, like if you cut down the surrounding trees and they shoot up, um, they'll get blighted within a few years and die back. It's very frustrating to watch. Now, my research is on the fungus, so I can't help showing some pictures of Petri dishes. Um, but the significance of this is, this is a fungus you can get to grow in a Petri dish. That means it's, it doesn't depend on the host being alive. It can grow on other stuff, including the outer bark of the tree, including on other species, including on dead wood and leaves on the forest floor. So it's really, really hard to get rid of it. It just happens to have some tricks up its sleeve that allows it to grow in live chestnut tissue. See, when it's on the surface with everything else, competing with thousands of different fungal species, it doesn't thrive. But because it has this ability to live, to get into the live tissue and resist the tree's defenses and, and grow there, it has the place to itself. And that's what gives it its advantage. And that's what makes it a pathogen. It gets into that live tissue, it kills the cells and digests them. And once again, in this dish, you can see the little fruiting bodies um, forming and that's where the spores come from. And in the next slide, this is a thousand time magnification of some juice from one of those fruiting bodies. And they look like jelly beans. Um, they're all spores 
And this picture, the width of this picture is one tenth of a millimeter. So you can imagine how many just billions and billions of spores we're dealing with just from that Petri dish that was in the last picture. And each one of these could start a new infection that could kill a tree. So with that kind of inoculum load out there, it's a miracle that anything survives at all. Um, and this is, you know, unfortunately you can't set back the clock. The, the pathogen is now here. Um, it's relatively harmless to the Japanese and Chinese chestnuts because they co-evolved with it and their defenses are attuned to the pathogen. But our trees don't have defenses against it and it's out of equilibrium and it's why it's wiping out its own host. The chestnut blight um, fungus was first observed killing trees at the Bronx Zoo in 1904. Um, so that's the epicenter of the epidemic. But actually we know that there were outbreaks in other places earlier than that. Uh, scientists have looked at the, the genetics of the fungus and they find it closely resembles the population of the fungus that's found in Japan. And so the theory is it, it came in on nursery stock, either Chinese or Japanese chestnut from Japan and then just spread to the American trees. And it was harmless to the trees that came in Probably nobody noticed it. It was an accident. But by 1950, um, the entire natural range of the tree was affected. As the, uh, and this is what it looks like when it passes through after a few years. So this was a predominantly chestnut forest that was completely obliterated by blight. Uh, this is also in Shenandoah area. And what would happen is the oaks and hickories would move in. So 10, 20 years later, you have forest again but it wasn't as productive and it couldn't support the same kind of wildlife. There are lots of other interactions you don't know about or you might not think about. Someone did uh, an experiment to see whether Chinese chestnuts or hybrid chestnuts would be as welcome uh, by wildlife as American was. And so they threw out some Chinese chestnuts and American chestnuts into some forested areas, just the nuts, I mean, and let the squirrels go after them. And they found that the squirrels preferentially selected the Americans first. They did like the Chinese and they did eat them, but their noses were, were you know, attracted to the smell of the American chestnut because they, they co-evolved with them. There's an interaction. The chestnut depends on those squirrels to carry the seeds around and lose them and spread the, the seedlings out so that they won't compete with their own mothers. But the squirrels depend on the chestnut too. And that interaction was severed with the demise of the tree. Other things could be, you know, the way the tree interacts with the soil, the types of mycorrhizal fungi that the tree recruits um, and puts in the forest soil. Take the tree away, the forest changes. And that's why we're trying to reverse this problem by bringing it back. Um, so as the chestnut blight spread away from the Bronx Zoo, um, and, and turned you know, forests to ghost lands, people noticed that the Chinese and Japanese chestnuts uh, along the way were relatively unaffected because it turns out the blight came from Asia and those trees are highly resistant to it. They get it. In fact, the blight grows all over them, but you don't really see symptoms except on branches that may already be weakened by damage, storm damage, insect damage, something like that. Otherwise, they're, they're pretty much immune. And um, so initially people hoped, well, maybe Chinese and Japanese chestnuts can take the place of American chestnut in our forest, but they don't grow tall and straight the way American does. The American on the left here actually looks pretty spread out and bushy because it's growing in the open, um, but is a much larger tree than the Chinese on the right. The Chinese on the right, you can see at the height of a man's chest is already breaking out into several trunks. And that isn't gonna work in a forest where you're competing with tulip poplars and white pines and, and other tall, fast growing trees. So, and, and you know what, if, if the Asian trees were adapted to our environment, they'd be there, right? I mean, since when have we been able to stop invasive trees from growing? Um, but you don't see it that much. Occasionally you see one, but 
there, you don't really see too many Chinese and Japanese growing in American forests. They're just not exactly adapted to it. So the next step was to try to breed. So they said, all right, Chinese isn't good. Americans too blight susceptible. Let's cross them. And so much of the 1920s and 30s, the people working on this chestnut blight tried to make crosses, 50-50 crosses, or they would cross the crosses back to either the American or the Chinese or Japanese, all different combinations, trying to come up with the perfect tree that would have all of the characteristics of American chestnut, but the resistance of an Asian tree. And they never got it. What they got 100% of the time were trees that would be um, intermediate, both in resistance and in size. And so they really weren't resistant enough or tall enough. And by the 1960s, this kind of breeding work had basically stopped and people you know, had basically given up on it. But thanks to a, a guy named Charles Burnham, who was a corn breeder and an academic, um, he took an interest in this in his retirement and said, you know, this is no different than if we were trying to breed disease resistance into corn or wheat, except at the pace that you can do it. And he suggested using something called back cross breeding. And very simply, what back cross breeding is, is you take the, the species you want, American chestnut, and the species, the exotic species that has the trait you want, Chinese chestnut, and you cross them. And then you take the products of that cross and you cross them back to the species that you want. You dilute out the exotic genes. And then you go through the offspring and you select them for the trait, in this case, resistance. And then you select the best of the offspring and you do it again. And then you do it again and you do it again. And when you get down to 15 sixteenths on average, um, your desired species, you should have something that physically can't be distinguished from uh, the pure line, but has enough of the exotic line to contain the resistance. Um, and then you cross those trees, those would be called third back cross trees, or we indicate them as B3 here in this chart. Um, you cross them with each other, so you get what's called B3F2s. Don't worry, there won't be a quiz on this. Um, and those trees have the potential to have inherited resistance from both sides of the family. And so you look through the progeny to find those. And once you have a population of those, they're not capable of passing on the susceptible American genes you know, that matter anymore. That's the theory anyway. Um, a little bit about how we tell how resistant they are. It's not that easy to tell. Um, so what we do is we drill a hole in the seedling bark and we put fungus from a Petri dish in it, seal it with tape, come back at six months and then one year, we measure the size of the resulting blight canker, which is the infection. Um, so you'll see on the left, a very resistant tree. It's not immune, there is infection here. You see some reddish discoloring, uh, some swelling. The tree's having an immune reaction to the infection, but it's containing it and it's otherwise perfectly healthy. Whereas the susceptible tree on the right, the the, it's swelling, it's cracking, it's caving in, there's fruiting bodies all over the place, which means the fungus is very happy. Um, and then you see these ridges, which is where the tree is trying to erect walls of thickened tissue to stop the fungus from spreading, but the fungus is pushing through it. And so they're you know, falling back and making newer and newer walls. Once this goes and girdles its way around the trunk, the, the stem will die. So this gets a good score on the left, bad score on the right. So the idea is once you get your, your B3 F2s, these trees that could potentially have inherited resistance from both sides of the family, we would put them in very tight, tightly spaced plots in an orchard and inoculate them when they're about three years old and then rogue out the most susceptible and hopefully leaving a ratio of like 150 to one so we'd plant 150 for every single tree we expected to keep, um, which seemed like a great idea. But what we learned in practice, and it wasn't until 2006, 
All right, American Chestnut Foundation started in 1983, and we had a head start by using some of those hybrid trees that were developed in the 30s and 40s. And even so, it took 40 years, or well, 30 years, to get to the point where we had these B3F2s. And they didn't perform quite as well as we hoped. It wasn't a total disaster, but it was not, it was a disappointment, I guess you could say. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like maybe at year six or so after most of the trees from one of those plots has been removed. And you see, obviously there's something wrong with these trees. They have these big knobby infections on them. Those are natural blight infections and they're sending up sh new shoots, which um, is an indication of stress. Um, and so they're not, that's not the way Chinese grow, that they haven't inherited the full resistance of Chinese. There are some that are better, but we find that they're very few and far between. And when they, they started actually, you know, doing some data collection, et cetera, et cetera, th this chart shows you the, the performance of that first generation of, of um, B3F2s. At the bottom, you see, the, the four uh, tree types. These are American chestnut on the left, Chinese on the right, and two different um, breeding lines of B3F2s called Clapper and Graves. And I don't know if you're familiar with these box charts, but the, the thick band in the middle here is the median value of what's being rated on the y-axis is how resistant they are, basically. Chinese is very high here, up at 100, whereas American is at zero. And we're getting scores of 10 or 20, um, which is, doesn't seem too good. Um, but we are capturing the genes. They're just not all in one tree. That's the problem. Um, and you have some outliers here. For example, in this clapper line, there are these dots. And some of these dots are overlapping with what we would consider normal for Chinese. So it isn't, um, obviously, the assumptions that went into the design of the program were wrong about the genetics of resistance, but we are capturing some of this resistance. And just to give you a, a feeling of hope, this is a very good tree that was developed in exactly that way through back cross breeding. And again, it doesn't look Chinese. It's got these um, thickened knobs around the places where natural blight infection has set in, but it's very contained. The tree is straight, tall, healthy, and um, this was taken several years ago, it's still alive um, and probably would have no trouble surviving in the forest and competing there. If we could produce these all the time, we'd be happy. We would do that and then let natural selection take over from there. But we can't predict, we can't reliably produce trees of this quality yet. Um, so I guess, I mean, that's where we are with back cross breeding now. So they've done some genetic work. And um, what they've learned from that is that they had thought that there were maybe two or three genes um, associated with resistance in Chinese chestnut. But by doing something called QTL analysis, which allows you to identify you know, big chunks of the genome that are associated with a certain trait, they were finding there's there seem to be chunks all over. Every chromosome seems to have some place that's lighting up as being associated with resistance. And that suggests that, you know, there's at least maybe eight, possibly more genes that are important that are involved in resistance. And when you deal with those kinds of numbers and trying to get all eight genes in a tree that you're breeding, you have to plant thousands and thousands of trees and that becomes impractical. So what we're working on now is trying to get uh, better information about those genetic, the, either the genes or markers near those genes that we can use as predictors of resistance so that we can grow the trees in pots, get DNA from them, and then test them to see if they have the genes we want before we plant them in the field. Um, that's kind of the way we're hoping to go. And it will, you know, eventually we'll find a few. We don't have to find them all. If we can find a few, 
we can improve the quality of these trees. So we'll bring in this new technology and um, you know, pivot in that direction. And it couldn't be done if we didn't have a big population of hybrid trees with a bell curve with some highly resistant ones and some highly susceptible ones. So it's just gonna take longer than we had hoped using this type of method. Now I mentioned that there are other methods being applied to this problem of chestnut restoration. Um, so one of them, uh, someone else mentioned um, the Virginia Tech American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation program. There are some American chestnuts that survive so, and they're blighted and sometimes they survive just because they're lucky. By the way, the one on the right is the now dead tree at uh, the American Chestnut Land Trust. We don't know why they survived. It could be they part European chestnut, which is slightly more resistant, or it could be that they're part chinkapin, which is slightly more resistant, or it could be that they were just lucky. Um, we don't know. Um, but some of them, <clears throat> when uh, if you can collect, if you can get um, twigs from them and graft them in an orchard, and they grow into branches which make flowers and you cross them, which is what the ACCF did, they find that yes, the progeny of these trees are more resistant than your average American. And th that we found a number of large surviving Americans that seem to be surviving because they have some above average level of resistance, some rare American genetic traits that make them a bit more resistant. Um, we have a grove of these in Hagerstown. One of our members owns it. Um, you can see a picture of the grove on the left. And these are all supposedly pure Americans, although we don't know their ancestry completely. And they are all showing, um, they're very blighted, but the, the blight infection is superficial. On, it's a close up on the right here. You can see it looks like it's wearing a sweater, right? This nice smooth bark here. And then you see this one giant blight canker going all the way down to the ground, but it doesn't go deep enough to cut off the nutrient flow. So the tree's still very healthy and produces flowers and nuts every year. Um, and I've actually used it in tests as controls. Um, and I've stopped because it's so resistant that it's outperforming um, some of the 50-50 crosses. Um, and so, you know, we need to look at these more. And if they don't necessarily all have the same traits. So if you cross them with each other, presumably you can do what's called gene stacking, where you get these different American origin traits. Now, for back crossbreeding, you don't want these trees in your program because all they do is trick you into thinking that your trees have inherited Chinese resistance. Um, but it doesn't mean you don't want these trees at all. You want them in the chestnut population because they have unique and possibly purely American sources of resistance. So they do have a role to play. But none of these trees, this whole grove is growing between two parking lots, gets full sun, great water, um, it, they may not do so well in a forest setting where they're competing with tall, taller trees. And I've never seen a large surviving American which is resistant enough in its own right to survive in the forest. Another approach is to try to replicate what happened in Europe. A European chestnut is slightly more resistant to the blight than American is, but probably not by much. Um, the real saving grace in Europe is a virus. In Europe, the chestnut blight epidemic started um, in the 40s and took off as bad, you know, as scarily as it did here in North America. But then by the 50s, a lot of the trees started recovering and getting better. And that was weird. And it wasn't until the 60s, 70s that they started to realize that the fungus itself had been infected with something. Eventually they determined that it was a virus. It's called the chestnut hypovirus. And it was the first fungal virus uh, ever discovered actually. Now there's, we know of quite a few, but, um, and 
it infects the fungus in Europe and prevents it from being too virulent so the trees aren't so badly damaged by it. And that's what keeps it under control. Other people have subsequently learned that hypovirulence is very common in China and Japan as well. It's part of the host pathogen relationship. Um, we've tried to introduce it in the United States and we've actually found uh, viruses here in North America that are attacking the fungus as well, but it doesn't seem to spread the way it spreads in Europe. So they've done experiments and the issue is, um, and this, this gets a little geeky, but I suspect that some of you will welcome that. Um, in these days of COVID, we think of viruses as spiky little balls that fly through the air and you breathe them in and get sick. But this virus, the chestnut hypovirus, doesn't have a shell at all. It only exists as a single strand of RNA. That's it. It doesn't have any kind of structure or body. And it gets into the fungal cells and it, that RNA tells the cell to build a little ball of membrane in which the fungus replicates. And it spreads to other fungus when the fun fungus grow together in the environment, touch each other and fuse. And then it flows with the other goop that's inside fungus from one colony to the other. Um, and that's how it spreads. But fungus doesn't always fuse. A fungal, even in the same species, it has to be the same vegetative compatibility type, which is, you know, how like we like to say, oh, you're not my type. Well, fung fungi really have that. And we know of six genes that determine your vegetative compatibility type in the fungus. And they all have to be the same for two different fungal colonies to fuse. If any of those six have different versions. They all have the same six genes, but the genes come in different versions. If any of those six are a different version, they won't fuse. And so um, in Europe, there are very few of these vegetative compatibility types. And so the fungus is, when it bumps into other fungus, it's very likely to be the same type. And so it fuses. But here in North America, the odds are it's gonna be a different type and it doesn't fuse. And that's why the virus doesn't seem to spread. So the University of Maryland, Dr. Don Nuss and his lab came up with uh, what they call a super donor stray. I don't know why I include this picture on the left. This is two Petri dishes. It just shows you the top one is the wild type fungus um, that is bright orange, which is its normal color. Uh, when, it's, when it's debilitated by the virus, it, it grows white. Every time I see this, it makes me think of Korean food and makes me hungry, um, but it's not a sliced daikon radish. Um, anyway, what they did was they took the chestnut blight fungus and they said, well, if the problem is incompatibility between those, those genes, the two different types of fungus, why don't we just take those genes out completely and see what happens? So they did that. So the fungus is a nobody. It's like, what type are you? I am not any type. So that means they confuse. And they did come up with what's called a super donor strain, which was infected with the virus, which meant that any other chestnut blight fungus it touched, it could fuse with. And they started treating cankers on trees by drilling holes around the edges of them and squeezing this um, fungus into the holes. And they come back six months later and it was completely healed. Um, and so this was seemed really promising and they thought, okay, now this will spread to all the other chestnut blight fungus on the tree. Uh, this work is being continued now in West Virginia, but unfortunately what we've learned in the 10 or so years they've been doing this is that it does heal the cankers, but it kind of dies out because the fungus weak, the, the virus weakens the fungus so much that it just di ends up dying over time and new uninfected fungus comes from the air or whatever and starts growing on the tree. And so they end up being blighted again. So it can be used to save a tree that you need to save. It can be used in an orchard setting, but it can't really um, be used yet um, to start this kind of 
continent-wide hypovirulence that we see in Europe. So that's an area of further research, but still promising. And from the fungus, by examining what the virus does to the fungus, we're also able to tell how the fungus um, is interacting with the tree. So it's a useful research tool, but not a promising cure yet. Um, the last of these various paths to restoration that I, I feel I need to talk about is genetic modification. Some of you may have seen articles about this. Um, there's work being done at the College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. Um, and you can go to their website and they have a lot more information than I will. But this picture is from a video of um, three different types of trees. Well, actually four. There were two transgenic trees in the middle and then Chinese chestnut on the left, American chestnut on the right. And it's part of a time-lapse video put to music. Um, so I highly recommend it. And it shows what they've done is micro inoculations of the stems with chestnut blight fungus. And it shows, you know, music goes on for a few seconds and then the American chestnut goes and dies. And then a few more seconds, the Chinese goes and dies and the two in the middle uh, stay fine. So what they did here was they, they understood that the fungus, one of the things the fungus produces as part of its infection strategy is a, is a compound called oxalic acid, which is pretty common in the fungal world. And a lot of plants have genes uh, for something called OXO, oxalate oxidase, which breaks down oxalic acid as a defense against their pathogens. And this includes peanuts, bananas, um, and wheat. So they took the OXO gene from wheat and they put it in chestnut. And they found they couldn't kill it with chestnut blight in the lab. Now, since then, they've grown these trees in the field. And you know they used to say, this is more resistant than Chinese chestnut. But now, um, I think we're all backing off from that because in the field, what you do see is after a number of years, you do see cankers on the trees, but they're superficial. Um, they're not, they don't look very harmful and the trees are healthy. Uh, whereas the Chinese chestnut, you don't see cankers, at least not of a very noticeable size. So this is a single mechanism of resistance. It's highly effective, but Chinese has got a lot of different resistance things going on. And that's a better strategy because eventually the fungus may adapt to defeat the OXO gene. Plus, this is a transgenic tree, which involves a lot of regulation and permitting. Um, ESF is now in the process of, of trying to get this deregulated because all of the transgenic trees they have are from one American parent. They're genetically identical twins. And you can't restore a species with identical trees. So they need to cross them with hundreds of other Americans to get that gene mixed in with the, the wider gene pool. And they can't do that until it's um, deregulated or permitted. They're going through that process now. Um, and I think that is all the sciencey stuff and all the bells and whistles I have to show you, but I'm happy to take questions. And so let me go back to my opening slide. And I also um, wanna say the American Chestnut Foundation um, is, um, you know, we're always looking for more surviving trees, especially surviving Americans uh, that flower. So if you find any, you know, um, email us and uh, we'll contact the American Chestnut Foundation. When we send us a picture, we can take a look, maybe go out and see it because we wanna get as much um, genetic diversity or breeding population as possible. And we're always looking for people to come out and help us and work in the orchards and um, inoculate trees or whatever. Um, so again, um, feel free to contact us if you're interested in doing that. Bruce, this is great. If, can you stop the share and we can come back together and have you on Spotlight and I will... Um... Yes. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions when you started talking about the genetics um, uh, about CRISPR and the use or of, of that technology. Um. Yep. Can you speak to that? Sure. Okay. So CRISPR is a tool. It's not a magic bullet. Um, 
what it is is it allows you to make edits to the genome. When when you um, when we talk about transgenic trees, for example, um, the the OXO tree that I described that developed in Syracuse. The old way of doing it was you you had to you transform a single cell, and I can't remember how they did it. I think they used something called a gene gun, which shoots a piece of DNA wrapped in tungsten into the cell. And they do it to like a zillion cells. And every once in a while, one of them will actually get inserted into the genome somewhere. And then they can grow that cell into a little ball of tissue and then treat it with hormones and light and grow that into a tree. And then check and see if that gene's being expressed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very time consuming and unpredictable because you don't know where the gene is going. Um, some of them work, some of them don't work. Um, then um, CRISPR allows you to be much more precise, to say, I wanna put it here in this part of the genome. Or for example, let's say we find out that there's a certain gene that exists both in American and Chinese chestnut. Um, okay, I'll give you an example. There's a gene called um, lacase. And, or I think it's called LAC1 is the name of the gene. And the two trees, are the, it, the, the genes are exactly the same in American and Chinese chestnut, but there's something called the promoter, which is like the on off switch for the gene that is upstream of the gene that is different in Chinese than in American. And so what would be really cool is if you could take an American chestnut and just cut out the American promoter and put in the Chinese promoter in its place you make very precise edits, presuming that that gene is involved in resistance, we don't know. Um, Amer it turns out chestnuts actually have their own OXO gene, but it doesn't seem to turn on when light infects the tree. So maybe we can find a, a way to bump up its expression. Um, and um, you could do that using CRISPR to sort of insert a different promoter in front of the, dream, uh, the gene from the one that's there or you can make edits to the gene or whatever. Um, so that's the beauty of CRISPR. Also, there's a regulatory aspect because if you bring in a gene from wheat, it becomes a genetically modified organism and it's heavily regulated. If you take an American chestnut gene and you just edit it, but the gene was already there in the first place, under current rules, it's not considered genetically modified. And so, you can go and test it and work with it, et cetera, and potentially release it. And I'll just say, I'm working with a fungus. And so I'm trying to use CRISPR also to use CRISPR to make very precise edits to the, to the fungal genome. And by looking for candidates for genes that are involved in invasion of the host, and if I can crisp, use CRISPR effectively, I can turn them off one by one and see which ones are important and which ones are not. All right. Um, what age does the chestnut flower? So in the field, usually you start seeing male flowers about seven years and female flowers a year or two after that. Um, you get some precocious trees that flower when they're two or three, maybe have a few flowers and uh, if you're doing breeding in a lab, there are tricks you can do with light to get at least male flowers in the first year. Okay. Um, Joe wanted to know if, uh, if using iNaturalist is a good way to share observations about um, chestnuts that you may see in the wild. Um, I don't think TACF is hooked up with iNaturalist. There is a, um, another app you can download called TreeSnap, um, which TACF supports and uses. So when I see a chestnut, like I, I saw one in New Haven last week and I, I tree snapped it with my TreeSnap app and it asks you a couple questions. You take a picture of it, you, you answer a couple questions and then you hit send and it sends uh, all the information in the picture into a database with the GPS coordinates. And TACF then gets a map of all of these reported trees and all of their characteristics. 
Okay, I'm not familiar with tree snap. Going to have to look that one up. Yeah. Um, Sarah says, do, 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 do. can you tell us anything about the species? Um, it's native predators, the insects and pathogens that would have fed on the tree before the blight. And are those species still present in our woodlands? Um, she's getting at enemy release. Enemy release? Yeah, Sarah, do you wanna, do you wanna explain that a little bit? You, you can unmute and ask sure. him. Yeah, so the reason that so many species that are introduced from alien countries, uh, they get here and they, they become invasive and aggressive here in a way that they weren't in their homeland is that the predators and the pathogens, the herbivores, you know, the insects and things didn't come with them. So yeah. they experience enemy release. I see. Right. Okay. So um, I don't, I don't have a comprehensive answer to you to that question. There are a lot of things that feed on chestnut. We see them in the orchard. Uh, there's something called the yellow striped caterpillar or something, dentata contracta or something, um, that can like defoliate a tree in a, in a couple days. Uh, we see them in the orchard sometimes. Um, but for the most part, it, it's, it, it is a pretty robust tree. If it weren't for chestnut blight and a few other invasive diseases, it would be doing very well. Um, gypsy moths like it, but not as much as, as they like oaks. Um, there are some natural chestnut pathogens, including one called pneumoniopsis. Um, but uh, the American chestnut has a degree of resistance to it comparable to Chinese. Um, so we're not, we don't really have problems with any of the native pathogens or pests. What we have problems with is invasives. And I didn't talk about it, but in addition to chestnut blight, there's another invasive Asian organism called Phytophthora, Phytophthora cinnamomai, um, which has a lot of hosts and, and has damages a lot of things, including azaleas and rhododendrons and a very, very uh, cotton um, cinnamon plant, that's how it got its name. It was brought in from Asia in the early 1800s somehow, and it inhabits the, the south and you know, more wetter uh, lowland soils. But it's, it, the Chinese chestnut's pretty resistant to it, but American chestnut's very susceptible. And so you can have a very blight resistant tree like we do, you know, like a very blight resistant hybrid, and then it will die of Phytophthora almost overnight. We've had that happen because with climate change or whatever, the Phytophthora is moving north and they're starting to detect it now in Maryland and Pennsylvania, uh, whereas it didn't used to be here. Um, there are some invasive um, insects. There's the chestnut gall wasp, which uh, came in from Asia and pretty much wiped out the, the commercial Chinese chestnut industry in Georgia in the 70s. And the gall wasp, um, you know, it's a wasp, lays its eggs on the tree, it makes galls, it does a lot of damage. And Chinese isn't resistant to it either, but it's kept in control in China by natural parasitoid wasps. And someone brought them over or they came over with the wasps and they're starting to catch up. This is like Knockwood possible success story. When we have gall wasp outbreaks, we usually find the second year, the gall wasps are, are they drop and we're finding the parasitoids with them. So that's good. And then there's the Asian ambrosia beetle, um, which also has a lot of hosts. It's particularly harmful to chestnuts of when they're about an inch and a half in diameter. We spray for them in our orchards because it's a big enough problem. So there's a lot of that. Um, there are weevils in the seeds, so, which is kind of gross if you want to eat them, but they, they don't really do a great deal of damage to the tree um, and, they're, and they're native. Other than that, I can't really think of any um, major natural predators. Thank you. 
Um, Joe says that he was look, he was he's just going back to iNaturalist. And there's a, a quite a few observations in there. So um, it might be useful for you to take a look at the observations in iNaturalist. Yeah. Um, there's several firms in Eastern PA, um, including oh, one of his own. I'll ask um, the people at the TACF headquarters whether they're doing that. They probably are. Great. Um, are, you, are you hopeful? I am. Um, so, you know, I've been at this, involved with this for 25 years. When I started, they didn't have any of the advanced hybrid trees. I have seen advanced hybrid trees that show a fairly good degree of resistance. And it doesn't have to be 100% like Chinese in order for the trees to survive. I think if we can get close to that, put the trees out in the wild, nature will take care of it. And it will get rid of undesirable Chinese traits like short stature or flowering too early. Um, and it will keep the, the desirable ones like blight resistance. Um, I'm also very optimistic about the genetics work. They've really made great strides with it. Right now we have a crazy map that shows all these suspected locations involved in resistance, but as you go from generation to generation, those chunks get smaller and more precise. And the technology is just changes from year to year. So things that seemed prohibitively expensive just a few years ago are now doable. Do we have any other questions for Bruce on the American chestnut, the rise, the fall, and the potential recovery? Put it in the chat box. I don't, I'm looking and seeing if any hands are raised. If you want to chat, unmute. Yes, I agree. It was a wonderful presentation, awesome presentation. Uh, thank you so much, um, Bruce. And uh, thank you for all the work that you, you've been putting into uh, this effort. Um, I love that you're hopeful and I'm going to just, I'm going to glom on to your hopeful coattails okay. and uh, enjoy, <laughs> and join in on that. Right. Um, but again, that's the science. The more we know, the, the more we understand, the, the, the more we know, but we don't know. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, you all look smarter, so take this knowledge and share it with other people and help make the world smarter. Like we like to say, we come with a question and, in, and, and leave with a quest. Uh, we don't leave with an answer, we leave with a quest. Um, and I hope that that is to go look for some chestnut trees, contact um, Bruce, get involved yeah. and uh, and it's and and you can be part of uh, of the of the recovery. And the uh, the American Chestnut Foundation's website is very easy to remember: acf.org. And you can find any state chapter through that. Then I, I'd encourage you to check it out. There's a lot of interesting information. That sounds wonderful. And do you do, do you have tours and things of the, of the, um... Yeah, they have a research facility in um, Meadowview, Virginia, where they'll give people tours. And if anybody is interested in, you know, seeing something closer to home, just contact me. Um, I don't mind if you give people my uh, email address. And, um, you know, I, I'll let you know uh, when we're going out or, or whatever, or invite you to come out and take a look at an orchard. Wonderful. I think we're going to have to take you up on that offer. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Stay, uh, stay safe and stay curious. And we'll see you next week, hopefully, uh, to learn about the symbiotic relationship between algae and the spotted salamander eggs. So come back for Must Learn Thursday with us. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.